She was America's reigning love goddess, a box office champion, and the GI's pinup dream girl. That brought on the Frisco quake. He was America's flamboyant artistic genius, perhaps the most influential filmmaker the world has ever known. I was very fond of horse. He had a great sense of humor. He was uh, a con man, uh, and he mostly got away with it. He was revered by many, despised by most. They had as much in common as an owl and a pussycat. And yet, when they met, they fell in love and married. They were Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles, beauty and the brains, one of the most unusual Hollywood couples. Margarita Carmen Cancino was born in New York City on October 17, 1918, the eldest child of a show business family. Her mother, a Ziegfeld showgirl, was part Irish descent, the daughter of an English actor whose theatrical roots dated back generations. The Spanish-born Eduardo Cancino, Margarita's father, was part of the Dancing Cancinos, a family vaudeville act that headlined on the Keith Orpheum and other circuits from coast to coast. Considered by his peers to be a master at the flamenco, as well as ballet, tap, and the tango, Eduardo began passing his knowledge on to his daughter as soon as she was able to walk. In fact, by the time she was four, she'd already appeared with her father in a recital at Carnegie Hall. The narcissistic Eduardo could be a harsh tutor. His insistence on absolute perfection may have resulted in his daughter becoming an accomplished dancer, but it also traumatized the girl's self-image, augmenting an already shy personality, and laid the groundwork for her unsatisfying future relationships with men. Eduardo Cancino saw the handwriting on the wall. Vaudeville was dying. The future was talking pictures. In the late 1920s, he moved his family to Hollywood, where he opened Cancino's professional dancing school. Eduardo would tutor some of Hollywood's brightest stars, Lupe Velez, Jean Harlow, and the incomparable James Cagney. But Eduardo knew that his school and his somewhat regular employment choreographing live prologues for the Los Angeles Carthay Circle Theater was small potatoes compared to another asset that he controlled. That asset was his 14-year-old daughter, Margarita Carmen Cancino. Margarita had developed into a beautiful young girl with a marvelous talent. Her father knew that with the proper guidance, his, she could become a major star in this new medium of motion pictures. Rita Hayworth was half Latina, half Irish, half Spanish, and her father was a Spanish dancer, and he toured the family all around the United States, but she was born in New York. When they settled in California, her father uh, had a dance school right here in Hollywood. And then any time any movie needed a Spanish dance or a girl in a cantina dancing, they would hire Rita's father and sometimes Rita to perform the Spanish dance routines in the film or the cantina girl, the Mexican dance routines. So that's how they started in films, by doing those routines. And that's how eventually Rita was discovered. If you see a lot of the old westerns, you may see Rita dancing in the cantina.
Suddenly, Eduardo had taken his daughter out of school and, at night, were performing a nightclub act together, often billed as husband and wife. The problem was that at 14, Rita was underage. So to avoid problems with the school board and the trial labor laws, Eduardo picked up his family and moved them closer to the Mexican border. It was while she and Eduardo were appearing in some of Tijuana and Agua Caliente's classier nightclubs that she was spotted by Winfield Sheehan, production head at Fox Studios. Sheehan was surprised that this shy, promising young girl spoke perfect English. He arranged a screen test, negotiated by Eduardo, of course. And the rest, as they say, is history. Listed in the credits as Rito Cancino, she made her official Fox film debut in Dante's Inferno, dancing with Gary Leone. Rita's screen time was minimal, but this was only the beginning. Orson Welles was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin in 1915, the day before the Germans sank the Lusitania off the Irish coast. His father was a successful inventor of automobile parts and accessories. He was also an alcoholic. His mother gave piano recitals, organized concerts, and didn't approve of her husband's drinking. The couple separated when their son was six. Orson was a strange little kid, definitely a genius, but also a snobbish little brat. It's said that he spoke like a college professor and looked like the evil Fu Manchu. One woman in the town who used to cross herself every time that mysterious little Wells child walked by. By the time he was five, Orson and his parents had moved to Chicago, and he had been given a puppet theater. That, he claimed, is what set him on the road to ruin. He began staging Shakespeare within his mini proscenium, and also started writing his own plays. Wells' mother died of hepatitis when he was eight, and since his father was really more interested in his alcohol and playboy ways than in raising his son, the youth came under the guidance of Dr. Maurice Bernstein. Bernstein was a respected Chicago physician who was Orson's mother's um, friend. Uh, he was the one that first recognized the boy's unique abilities, and he convinced Orson's father, Richard Wells, that they should be allowed to develop. They enrolled him in the Todd Seminary for Boys in Woodstock, Illinois. Now, actually, that's a misstatement. Orson agreed to go there providing they let him run the dramatics department. For the next few years, Orson flourished at Todd, staging and performing in one play after another. He even agreed to take some of the academic classes. Then, at 16, he passed up a Harvard scholarship in favor of doing some world travel. He was visiting Ireland, and he had just been to, he says, <laughs> he said, he had just been to the Great Wall of China. I don't, didn't believe it for a moment. But anyway, he walked into the gate and announced he had been there because he, he'd been playing in China and all over the world, so they gave him a leading role. And he'd never been on a professional stage in his life. So he, he started to perform. He impressed them terribly, though he had, was not a professional actor. But he became one in the gate because they put him into lead after lead and he was of such personal weight that he was able to carry them. Armed with a box of rave reviews for his performances at the gate, Orson returned to America, where there were far richer worlds yet to conquer. Rita Cancino had not done well at Fox. Cast in a series of small roles in relatively unimportant films, she had failed to impress anybody except her sponsor, Winfield Sheehan. Thus, when Fox Films merged with 20th Century Pictures in 1935 to form 20th Century Fox, Sheehan was replaced by Daryl F. Zanuck, and one of the new studio head's first acts was to drop Rita Cancino's contract. But while she had been at Fox, Rita met a man who would affect her life both professionally and personally for the next several years. His name was Edward C. Judson. Three times married and divorced, he was more than twice Rita's 19 years of age. He'd come to her after seeing one of her screen tests and, almost immediately, became both her boyfriend, manager, and substitute father figure. Once her Fox contract was dropped, he began haunting the offices of independent production companies and managed to get his client key roles in some B-Westerns. 
On May 29, 1937, Rita and Judson were married. She didn't know about his previous marriages until after she'd said, I do. But that was a small price to pay, she thought, in order to escape from her father's house and his authoritarian control. Unfortunately, what she was really doing was trading one despot for another. While Rita was doing B-pictures at Columbia, Judson worked behind the scenes to enhance her screen and public image. First off, there was a name change. Both he and Harry Cohn felt there were too many Latin dancers on the Columbia lot. So Rita Cancino took her mother's maiden name and became Rita Hayworth. It was also Judson, upon the advice of hairdresser Helen Hunt, who decided that his wife should abandon her Latin dancer image altogether by not only lightening her naturally dark brown hair to auburn, but also undergoing a series of electrolysis treatments to alter her hairline. Rita agreed to undergo the uncomfortable process that, over a period of months, transformed her image from sultry senorita into the woman who America would ultimately name as their love goddess. Despite all of Judson's efforts, Rita was still being cast at Columbia in B projects. What she needed was a breakout role in an A picture, and that opportunity came along in 1939 when she was cast by director Howard Hawks in Only Angels Have Wings. This is Barranca, a South American banana port where men live by their daring and women by their charm. This exciting adventure film about pilots who fly the dangerous mail routes through the mountain peaks of South America had Rita playing the old flame of Cary Grant. So much the better. Who is now married to disgraced pilot Richard Barthelmus. Suddenly, Harry Cohn found that he had a new star on his hands. Other studios were asking to borrow the striking auburn-haired beauty, and they were willing to pay generous loan-out fees to get her. Cohn and Columbia kept the loan-out fees, while Rita just kept her relatively meager little salary. And she didn't see much of that, because Eddie Judson was keeping strict control of their finances. At MGM, Rita appeared in Susan and God with Joan Crawford and Frederick March. She traveled to Warner Brothers to appear opposite James Cagney and Olivia de Havilland in The Strawberry Blonde. The time when you kissed me when we were dancing, uh, was that just one of those things of, I mean, did it mean anything to you or was it just one of the... Bill, do you think I'm the kind of a girl who just goes around kissing boys? Oh, no, certainly not. It was just that... He's not scientific, but simply terrific. But he's got these gals in his arms. It's just made for you. It's a real soccer-roo. See Strawberry Blonde, boy, it's terrific. See Strawberry Blonde. But the film that really skyrocketed her to superstardom was made back at the studio that had dropped her contract several years earlier. At 20th Century Fox, she appeared opposite Tyrone Power in the classic Blood and Sand. Tyrone Power plays the greatest role of his career as Juan Gallardo, Rita Hayward as Doña Sol, a luring adventuress, woman of the world with an irresistible fascination, glittering pageantry, and the fiery romance of an immortal novel that becomes a never-to-be-forgotten motion picture triumph. she may have been approaching the pinnacle of her success, but she still had those two tyrants in her life. By the late 1930s, Orson Welles had become the most talked about actor in the New York theater. Working with the controversial government-sponsored Federal Theater Project and later with his partner John Hausman and his own Mercury Productions, he had presented revolutionary stagings of Macbeth with an all-black cast, Dr. Faustus and a modern-dressed Julius Caesar, which had more to do with the fascist Italy of Mussolini than ancient Rome. So inflammatory were some of Wells' productions that he staged Mark Litstein's pro-union opera, The Cradle of Rock, in 1937. The federal government sent troops to lock the players out of the theater on opening night. Enraged by this action, Wells and his company led their audience through the streets of New York City to another theater where the actors, forbidden by their union to perform on stage, presented this groundbreaking play from the audience. Many of the people in the audience were just there as an act of political defiance, but they, 
sat mesmerized as actors stood next to them and sang the roles. They were witnessing theatrical history. Orson had married Virginia Nicholson, a Chicago socialite, in 1934, but he spent little time at home. When he wasn't working in the theater, radio audiences heard his distinctive voice weekly on a variety of programs, including The Shadow. <laughs> Then, on October 30th, 1938, Wells' own radio program, The Mercury Theater on the Air, presented an adaption of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds, disguising it as an actual news broadcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Wait a minute, something's happening. Oh, the whole field caught up by the woods of Barnes. The gas tank, tank the automobile. Earthy creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grovis Mill. I can give you no authoritative information. Across America, radio well, listeners panicked and ran from their homes. The next day, Orson Welles was no longer just the boy wonder of Broadway. His name was a household word. Isn't there anyone? You were aware of terror at the time you were giving this role. Were you aware that terror was going on throughout the nation? Oh, no. Of course not. I was uh, frankly terribly shocked to learn that, that uh, it did. The War of the Worlds broadcast became a historical phenomenon. For decades, psychologists and sociologists have studied it as a classic example of public mass hysteria. In 1939, Orson was handed what he called the biggest toy train set any boy ever had. It was a movie studio. RKO Pictures hired Orson to write, direct, produce, and star in motion pictures with complete autonomy over the final cut. It was an unheard of deal back then, and it earned the boy wonder, the animosity of many of Hollywood's veterans. Separated from his wife, Wells and his Mercury production settled in at the RKO lot. While he was deciding what his first film would be, he began enjoying Hollywood's nightlife and soon was seen regularly around town with exotic actress Dolores Del Rio, who was several years his senior. Citizen Kane was the film that Wells finally decided to make for RKO. It was a thinly disguised biography of newspaper baron William Randolph Hearst and his longtime mistress, Marion Davies. Orson and I had, had gone through our five years of, of fun games and triumphs and, and problems, and I'd gone off to New York. Our partnership was ended. And then um, he came to New York and asked me if I would go back just for now and work with Herman Mankiewicz, who had this idea uh, that they'd worked on together about a newspaper tycoon, the life of a newspaper tycoon. And so I did, and Herman had broken his leg in a motor accident. And so we shipped him off to Victorville. I went with him. And we lived in Victorville for almost three months and came out with this 240-page script, mm -hmm. which was the, the basis of Citizen Kane. I mean, this argument has become so boring that I hate even to talk about it. But, I mean, it, it is a fact that the basic idea of that script was Herman Mankiewicz's, mm -hmm. and Orson being a very creative man, a genius, and a great director, obviously, greatly influenced the final form of that script, so that the argument has really become idiotic. Mm -hmm. It was Orson's picture, and that's all there is to it. Herman Mankiewicz wrote the script on which the picture was based. From his nationally syndicated gossip columnist, Luella Parsons, Hearst had learned that Wells' film not only painted an unsympathetic portrait of him, but also delved into the most intimate aspects of his relationship with Ms. Davies. Outrage, he was determined that this motion picture would never be seen by the general public. He had already decreed that no RKO picture could be advertised in a Hearst paper, and now he began putting pressure on the heads of the other studios, threatening to punish Hollywood as a whole through his network of newspapers if Citizen Kane was ever released. 
Louis B. Mayer, head of Metro Golden Mayer, was representing all the studios when he approached RKO with a handsome cash offer in exchange for their burning the negative and all prints. The RKO brass refused. Right. Give me a knife. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Welles. I'm speaking for the Mercury Theater, and what follows is supposed to advertise our first motion picture. Citizen Kane is the title, and we hope it can correctly be called a coming attraction. It's certainly coming, coming to this theater, and I think our Mercury actors make it an attraction. I'd like you to meet them. Speaking of attractions, well, the chorus girls are certainly an attraction. But frankly, ladies and gentlemen, we're just showing you the chorus girls for purposes of ballyhoo. It's a pretty nice ballyhoo. But here are some of our real Mercury people. This is the first time you've seen most of them on the screen. Hey, uh, give Joe a little light. Thanks. Now smile for the folks, Joe. Smile. Joseph Cotton, ladies and gentlemen. That's it. Joseph Cotton. I think you're going to see a lot of him. Here's Ruth Warwick, whom I know you love. Ruth. Look at the camera, Ruth. <laughs> we caught Ruth with her hair up. And here's somebody you've all heard on the radio, so I don't have to tell you he's wonderful. Ray Collins. Dorothy Comengore is a name I'm going to repeat. Dorothy Comengore. I won't have to repeat it much longer. You'll be repeating it. And here's George Kouluris, who's a grand actor. I'll say that name again. George Kouluris. Watch it. Here comes Everett Sloan. Look out, Everett. Oops. Everett Sloan, ladies and gentlemen. He isn't necessarily a comedian. And here's one of the best actors in the world, Agnes Moorhead. I've said a lot of nice things, but Erskine Sanford deserves some more. Erskine, Erskine Sanford. So does Paul. Paul, Paul Stewart, everybody. Citizen Kane is a modern American story about a man called Kane, Charles Foster Kane. I don't know how to tell you about him. There's so many things to say. I'll turn you over instead to the characters in the picture. As you'll see, they feel very strongly on the subject. Charles Foster Kane is a, 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 a started the war. But do you think if it hadn't been for Mr. Kane, the United States would have the Panama Canal? Charles Foster Kane is nothing more or less than a communist. Kane, governor. Listen, when the voters of this state and Mrs. Kane learn what I found out about Mr. Kane and a certain little blondie named Susan Alexander, he couldn't be elected dog catcher. I'm going to skin Mr. Charles Foster Kane alive. I'm going to marry him next week at the White House. Emily, I hear you've been stepping out with Charlie Kane. What? Are you? Of course I love him. I gave him $60 million. Well, of course I love him. He's the richest man in America. That's what all the girls say about him at first, but you know... <laughs> I can't help but admire him. He's crazy. He's wonderful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you'll think about Mr. Kane. I can't imagine. You see, I play the part myself. Well, Kane is a hero and a scoundrel, a no account and a swell guy, a great lover, a great American citizen, and a dirty dog. It depends on who's talking about him. What's the real truth about Charles Foster Kane? I wish you'd come to this theater when Citizen Kane plays here and decide for yourself. Citizen Kane had its premiere at the Palace Theater in New York on May 1st, 1941. Critics raved about Wells' film, calling it the most surprising and cinematically exciting motion picture to be seen in many a moon. Indeed, film historians have universally named it the greatest American motion picture ever produced. At 26, Orson Welles had reached the apex of his career. From there, he had only one direction that he could go. By 1942, Rita Hayworth was in the process of divorcing Edward Judson and was being escorted around town by Victor Mature, her leading man in My Gal Sal. Divorcing Eddie Judson was not an easy task. He'd already taken their community property, which he had earned, and put it in his own name. And as soon as she told him he was, she was leaving him, he took the cash, opened up his own safety deposit boxes, and stuffed it in there. And if that wasn't enough, he told her that if she did leave him, he was going to scar her face, so she'd never work again. 
Nice guy. Despite her personal problems, Harry Cohn kept Rita working. She was, after all, the biggest star on the Columbia lot. Victor Mature had been called into the Coast Guard, and one evening Rita was invited to a party hosted by the Joseph Cottons. Cotton, of course, was a close friend and colleague of Orson Welles, and, in fact, Orson had asked him to throw the party for the express purpose of meeting Rita, who he was determined to make his second wife. Wells' career had begun its downward spiral. Despite its glowing reviews, Citizen Kane had not done well at the box office, and his second film, The Magnificent Ambersons, had been taken away from him while he was out of the country and recut by the studio. It had also flopped. His RKO contract at an end, Orson was now acting in films that he did not direct, and was also contemplating quitting films and theater altogether and venturing into a career in politics. Once Orson met Rita, that was the end of his relationship with Dolores Del Rio. As Orson once said, uh, meeting Rita was the fantasy of every GI. GIs who, during World War II, voted Hayworth the number one pinup girl. And I don't think the GIs were horsing around when they selected her. Thank you. Thank you very much. There really isn't anything for me to say besides that, so I won't say it. In Rita, Wells found a woman who was totally unlike her provocative screen image. He was infatuated by her sweetness and her naturalness. Yet troubled by her obvious shyness, the result of her insecurity about her lack of education. Conversely, Rita was flattered by this brilliant man's attention. He actually listened to what she had to say and seemed genuinely interested. He even suggested books that she should read. True, in Orson, she had found another father figure. But unlike Eduardo or Eddie Judson, he wasn't out to exploit her. He wanted to protect her. Rita was working on CoverGirl with Gene Kelly when her very ugly divorce from Judson became final. One afternoon during her lunch break, she and Orson snuck off to City Hall and were married. Much of Hollywood frowned on the marriage. Harry Cohn wasn't happy that his biggest star was now taking advice from the town's most renowned maverick filmmaker. And gossip Luella Parsons was upset that one of her favorite actresses was now led to the man that she detested for making Citizen Kane, the movie that had publicly humiliated her boss, William Randolph Hearst. But at that point in time, Orson and Rita didn't care what others thought. They were secretly planning to abandon Hollywood forever. More than anything, she longed for a less complicated life as a wife and mother. Orson, unable to find work as a film director, was still seriously contemplating entering politics. He actively campaigned for Franklin Roosevelt's re-election, wrote a regular political column for the New York Post, and, for a time, even considered running for the Senate in his home state of Wisconsin. Ultimately, he decided against running for office. He returned to Hollywood, where he was finally offered a job to both direct and star as a Nazi war criminal in what was to be the most conventional and also the most entertaining film of his career. The citizens of Harper, they've come after you. The plain little ordinary people, the ones you've been laughing at, have Franz Kindler. Well, you can't fool them anymore. Oh, sure, you can kill me, Mary, half the people down there. But there's no escape. You had the world and it closed in on you till there was only Harper. That closed in on you and there was only this room. And this room, too, is closing in on you. It's not true, the things they say I did. It's all their idea. I followed orders. You gave the orders. I, I only did my duty. Don't send me back to them. I can't face them. I'm not a criminal. It was during this period that she starred in Gilda. The picture might not have been a favorite with the critics, but this was the role for which Rita Hayworth will always be remembered. What did you say to him? I just told him if a man answers, hang up. Didn't you hear about me, Gabe? If I'd been a ranch, they would have named me the bar nothing. There never was a woman like Gilda, or a picture like Gilda. Columbia's outstanding screen triumph, starring Rita Hayworth with Glenn Ford. That's what I told Val, and that's what you're going to tell me. Making me deceive my husband. I got some news for you, Gilda. He didn't just buy something. 
He's in love with you. One man bought Gilda. Another hated her and hungered for her. I hate you too, Johnny. I hate you so much that I think I'm going to die from it. Gilda, inflaming men's hearts with a kiss or a song. Stop. What do you mean by it? Now they all know what I am. And that should make you happy, Johnny. It's no use just you knowing it, Johnny. Now they all know that the mighty Johnny Farrell got taken. And that he married a... You look at somebody and they're putting on a performance for the, the public. Uh, whether they're actors or whether they're just people. They're putting on a performance for others. And then they're alone together afterwards. And that's, if you were there, then you'd know if it was a happy marriage or not. Otherwise, I could never judge. All was not well in the Wells household. There was no question that the couple loved each other, but Rita's deeply ingrained insecurities made her intensely jealous, even if Orson casually glanced at another woman. For her emotional stability, the love goddess required almost constant attention from her husband. Yet Orson, with his political activities and his ongoing efforts to mount another film or stage production, was often absent, even if he was there. When Rita got pregnant, she hoped that that would give her the family and home life that she'd always longed for. But that wasn't in the cards. Orson was not a family man. He was obsessed with his career. The fact that Orson was away during much of Rita's pregnancy did not help their marriage. He had been in Los Angeles in December of 1944 when their daughter Rebecca was born. But he left her alone a few weeks later to attend FDR's inauguration. That upset Rita, even though she was still too weak to travel. However, what she could never really forget is what happened while Orson was away, attending the inauguration and to his various business activities, including a multi-city lecture tour. Rita's mother died suddenly, and Orson did not fly back for the funeral. While he was filming The Stranger, Orson had lived in an apartment on the studio lot. When production finished, he flew back east to confer with composer Cole Porter about a musical production of Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. It was during this period that Rita, feeling neglected and abandoned, announced that she was divorcing him. Orson was surprised by his wife's action, particularly since there had been no previous discussion about it. Yet he was tired of the struggle of trying to make this emotionally unbalanced woman happy. Orson was in Boston struggling to get his uh, production of Around the World ready for its Broadway premiere. And then he lost his backer. He was desperate, so desperate that he called Harry Cohen, who hated him. He told Cohen about a fantastic book he'd read that would make a great film. And he agreed to write, direct, and star in that film if Cohen would just loan him the $50,000 he needed to open his show. Cohen agreed. But what he didn't know was that Orson had never even read the book in question. He'd just seen it lying around the theater box office and had used the title to sell Cohen on giving him the money. When Orson finally read the book, he discovered that it was virtually unfilmable. So he quickly wrote a screenplay that bore little resemblance to its source. The film became The Lady from Shanghai, and its co-star was none other than Rita Hayworth. Despite everything that had happened, Rita still loved Orson, and she thought that maybe by working together it might patch up their marriage. The first thing that Orson required of his star is that she cut off the long auburn hair that enhanced her love goddess image and dye the remainder topaz blonde. When Harry Cohn heard about this after the fact, he was furious, which only made Orson and Rita's grins that much wider. Much of The Lady from Shanghai was filmed in Mexico, and a good deal of that on Errol Flynn's yacht, the Zaka. Well, your husband can take care of himself. Nice night for it, ain't it, Mr. O'Hara? 
You didn't answer me, Mr. O'Hara. You ought to speak when you're spoken to. I'd hate to have to report you to the lady's husband. I said it's a nice night for it. Oh. Hey, Mike, if you'll pardon me this intrusion, there's a couple of police officers out here. Of course. I don't speak their language, see? And they want me to identify this guy. What's the Spanish for drunk and bum? Can you think of any reason why your husband would want to hire a divorce detective? As a matter of fact, you and Michael O'Hara have kissed each other, haven't you? To name one occasion, you were seen in the aquarium of this city kissing each other. Do you deny that? No. Orson and Rita did renew their romance while the picture was being made. But Cohn hated, or perhaps didn't understand, the film and delayed its release. In the meantime, Orson began developing other projects, which again drew him away from the close relationship he'd once again shared with Rita in Mexico. The divorce proceedings went forward. When The Lady from Shanghai was finally released, the public turned their backs on it. They didn't like Rita's new blonde hairstyle, nor did they like the fact that she was playing a scheming villainess who died in the end. But the critics and film historians have hailed Wells' film as another of his innovative masterpieces. With Wells out of the picture, Harry Cohn and Columbia tried and succeeded in restoring Rita's screen persona as the seductive temptress. Fans came out in droves to see her reunited with Glenn Ford in the Technicolor extravaganza, The Loves of Carmen. The gypsies say that a lover should have gentle hands, a gentle mouth, and a gentle heart. And a woman the same? No. She should have cruel hands, a cruel mouth, and no heart at all. Must you roll your eyes at every man, even the colonel? My eyes are my own to send where I please. Must I tell you again? A little lesson for a little corporal. Who is he? Who's that fellow? Garcia. He's our leader. He's our husband. You keep your filthy money. Just what did you have in mind, Caballero, that you do want in payment for the work you do here? Is there anything else that belongs to me that you were thinking about? Where did you get that dress? The devil is my witness. I'll kill you. I'll kill you if you don't answer me. With Harry Cohen bad-mouthing him all over town, Orson had gotten the reputation of being a director that couldn't finish a film without going way over budget. So he decided to prove that his critics were wrong. Orson went to see Herbert J. Yates of Republic Pictures, the home of Roy Rogers and John Wayne B. Westerns. He pitched Yates on doing a prestige picture, Shakespeare's Macbeth. What convinced the initially reluctant studio head is that Orson promised him that he could shoot the entire picture in three weeks. And he did. How could he do it? He'd recently staged the play in Salt Lake City, and he utilized the same cast, including Jeanette Nolan, Roddy McDowell, and Dan O'Herlihy. We did it on stage first in Salt Lake City, then came back and we did it on tape, sound tape. And then when we were shooting, he decided to shoot two scenes at the same time in the same stage, which of course you couldn't do normally. Uh, and uh, he said, now play it. And uh, you played your scene and they played their scene, but there was no microphone. Uh, uh, what happened was he played the tape. And as you were playing your scene, you matched what was going on and you played it so often that you did it quite well. And uh, so he uh, shot a lot of the picture with no sound. Macbeth! Acclaimed throughout the years as one of the most thrilling and exciting entertainments ever conceived. The clashing conflict of arch enemies fighting to the death. All this you will see in what we sincerely believe is one of the most memorable motion pictures ever built. 
in the scene in the, the Shakespeare film, he has to come over and he, in a rage, and he picks up this enormously long table, uh, very heavy, very heavy, and throws it over and everything on it went flying onto the ground and so on and so forth. So at the end of the scene, uh, he said, that was pretty good, wasn't it? I said, yes, made you look very strong. Lucky you had balsa wood table. So. <laughs> Macbeth was an interesting and innovative film, but it didn't put Orson back in the Hollywood mainstream. He moved to Europe, where for the next several years he accepted roles in films like Prince of Foxes. He's got the grace of a dancer, the wrist of an assassin. Then the third man. Orson, who was only on screen for about 10 minutes in The Third Man, come once on, described come on, his role with Harry Lyon as the best star part ever written. Step out in the light and let's have a look at you. Who's your boss? You're too dead, no one. What's this in the loose? Some was supposed to be new, Rob Dane. Sounds it tepid. Yeah, see, man, he shouts it so blood. And if Rick had his stuff with me, I'm not to any gravel to move. Orson wasn't so much interested in acting in movies made by others as he was in earning the money to make his own films, like Othello and Confidential Report. In 1958, he was finally given the opportunity to direct another film in Hollywood, Touch of Evil, a film noir classic. This was her wedding night. Where was the man she had married? Who were these hoodlums? Golden Lakes. Only the offbeat, original, creative powers of Orson Welles could bring you so suspenseful, so gripping, so different a drama of love threatened by vengeance. Mike may be spoiling some of your fun. Mike? My husband, yeah. And if you're trying to scare me into calling him off, let me tell you something, Mr. Grandy. I may be scared. But he won't be. This is the memo, um, 58 pages, look at that, <laughs> that Orson Welles um, passionately wrote after the studio uh, gave him one viewing of the uh, editing job that they had done on Touch of Evil. And this, he went mm. home and, and this was what he wrote. These were his su suggested These changes. These were his begging changes. Mm. Please, you know, mm -hmm. um, even though that it isn't, you've taken it away in terms of it's not longer, no longer what he had intended as a right. picture. But he said, please, even in your version, don't ruin it by, by keeping certain things in. And he I see. meticulously yeah. outlined what, sh you know, mm. what should be done, in including this much of a close-up. Oh. And this is after one viewing. Unbelievable. So you can see the mind that this man had, and you can see how true his vision was, because he saw in a second mm -hmm. what was wrong. You framed that boy. Framed him! <laughs> of a manhunt like nothing you've ever experienced. Oh, God, now I have a husband. What did you do with her? Where is my wife? I've learned something from certainly every director I've worked with. Orson Welles, who was one of the most gifted, naturally gifted, if not disciplined and not, uh, not entirely balanced filmmakers I've ever worked with. He said, uh, making movies is the best set of electric trains any little boy ever had to play with. Sadly, the studio bosses could not relate to Orson's novel style of filmmaking. The movie was taken away from him and recut. Even though it was flawed, that um, that the original, uh, you know, initial mm -hmm. release maintained a place as as a in, as a cult classic. But now these audiences who either loved that and and can't wait to see the way he wanted it, and the ones who haven't seen the original will see something that right. is is as today as anything is. Throughout his life, Orson was fascinated by magic. During World War II, he performed tricks with the USO tours to entertain the troops. Later, he would do his magic in movies, as well as taking his elaborate show to Las Vegas, where he continued to delight and mesmerize audiences. 
Wells returned to his vagabond ways, acting in films for others in order to finance his own projects. To compensate for his frustrating lifestyle, he ate, and ate, and ate. I, I went into the Brown Derby, and I ordered a strawberry shortcake. And while I was eating it, Orson happened to enter the restaurant, saw me and came over, picked up the strawberry shortcake and said, you can't afford to eat these things, you just put on weight. And he lumbered out of the <laughs> restaurant and threw the strawberry shortcake into the street. And then he returned. Now, we wait 20 years and I'm doing a, a movie in Italy. And the producer, director, says to me, Orson is downstairs getting up. He's playing the king, and uh, you should go down and say hello. So down I went, opened the door, stood there in full uniform. Orson was making himself up at the mirror, embarrassingly fat. Didn't appear to look at me, and he said, uh, he didn't say anything. He just looked and looked away again. And I looked at him and I decided to open the conversation by saying, I thought you promised to give up strawberry shortcake too. So, <laughs> he got very angry, his sense of humor failed him. While most of the remainder of Orson's years were spent trying to come up with the financing to make his own films, his former wife, the non-publicity-seeking Rita Hayworth, found that their tantalizing off-screen activities kept making front-page news in both the tabloids and the scandal magazines. Her romance and subsequent marriage to international playboy and Muslim religious leader Ali Khan kept her out of films for several years and also produced another daughter, Yasmin. Their divorce and subsequent legal battles made even bigger headlines than the courtship. Rita returned to films until she met and married singer Dick Hames, which turned out to be the most devastating relationship of her life. Indeed, during the relatively short time she was with the singer, he not only almost destroyed her career, but when she finally left him, she was virtually broke. Hollywood can be a forgiving town, particularly when a studio believes that a star still has box office clout. So, Rita continued to work, and even began to garner respectable reviews That's as a dramatic why actress. The lady is a tramp. This is the master suite. By the way, where is the master? My husband died two years ago, and no cracks. After all, two years is a long time between drinks. Anyone who had that infinite class, which they did, and Judy did, and Rita Hayworth did, they had it's infinite class, frightened of life, petrified of not succeeding. If they were born now, they wouldn't fit. Who have we got? Come on, who have we got? Tom Cruise? How forgettable. Who have we got in women? Demi Moore? Oh, please. Sharon Stone going to be Marilyn Monroe? She going to be Lana Turner? Come on. Who have we got? Until his death in 1985, Orson continued to make his movies. Wells' pictures may not have set any box office records, but they certainly left us with a Thank film you. legacy that has never been equaled. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Orson Wells. Unable to work in her later years and under the care of her daughter, Yasmin, Rita died from complications of Alzheimer's disease in 1987. Didn't hear about me, Gabe. If I'd been a ranch, they would have named me the bar nothing. There never was a woman like Gilda. Rita Hayworth and Orson Wells each always considered the other to be the great love of their lives. They just couldn't be together. And so it often is in the high-profile and oft-time turbulent world of Hollywood couples. If it had to be you, it had to be you. I wandered around and finally found somebody who could make me be true.
could make me be blue And even be glad just to be sad Thinking of you Some others I've seen Might never be mean Might never be cross Or try to be boss But they wouldn't do For nobody else Gave me a thrill With all your faults I love you still It had to be you Wonderful you It had to be you 